All right, it's the Sunday before Christmas, but you have no idea what we're talking about, right? Uh, if you've been worshiping with us the last several weeks, if you watched online, you know we are in this series that we're calling Home for the Holidays, um, and, and we're, we're kind of leaning into this concept that it's kind of real and kind of uh, fresh for many of us um, in the middle of a pandemic, um, and it's this idea that, that, that what, it, what home looks like and what does it mean to be home? Uh, in my small group this uh, just a couple days ago, we, I asked the question like, "What do you like? What are the traditions that you like about being home for Christmas?" And we all shared, you know, the things that we appreciated. Talk, I talked about the family farm that we grew up on. We talked about kind of the traditions and that we like to do. I remember, did anybody grow up in a, in a house where for Christmas, like, you kind of got dressed up even though you didn't really go anywhere? Is that anybody? <laughs> That's what we did. My wife's family was not the same way. So the anticipation for, for her family is you're wearing pajamas all day, right? <laughs> so like I need like classy pajamas so I can be like halfway, halfway between. In this, we've talked a lot about this idea of worship, and I hope that you've seen some of these repetitive themes because that's, that's not unintentional. And it's interesting that all of these characters in the Christmas story have some things in common. Right? They're not home. Right? They're not at their physical dwelling. They're not at the place that they would have called home. Mary and Joseph were traveling. The shepherds were out in their field. Today, we're talking about these guys, these wise men, right, who, were not, who came from afar. And then there's also this element of worship that we see that happens. And we're going to explore that a little bit more today because, because as we've looked at these trends and this idea of this almost restlessness with the here and the now, the restlessness with this life that we are, are born into, the restlessness that maybe shepherds or the wise men felt, right? This longing for salvation that we have, right? Is met with the presence of Jesus, who we celebrate at Christmas. He was born, he came, he was a baby. And in the middle of this restlessness with the world, people who did not feel at home found worship in the form of a savior. I know we got. I feel like we skipped to the end. Like it's the very beginning. This is normally like the part where I tell a funny story, but this these are the recurring themes we're talking about. And so this morning we're talking about the wise men. We remember the wise men, right? Now I have an illustration, right? The wise men they brought um, gold and frankincense for Jesus, and oh yeah, but wait, there's myrrh. <laughs> The worship team was giving me a hard time. It's such a bad dad joke. I saw that meme this week and I laughed like uncontrollably for longer than I should have in a public place. And I thought I would share it with you. There's myrrh, right? Gold, frankincense, myrrh. We're going to jump into that. We're going to talk about the wise men today. It's interesting when, when I look at kind of the, the times that we live in. You see, we live in a world that is constantly looking to make life easier. It's funny that, that, that people joke about this idea of artificial intelligence rising up and like, like conquering like humans, like the Matrix, the Terminator concepts, like the computers become self-aware. Because in the process of making our life easier, we're trying to automate more and more. I call this the, the remote, I call this remote control syndrome. This is what I mean. What happens when we have a remote control that we know, we love, we cherish it. it. It helps us be relaxed and switch the channels. And then all of a sudden, you have children. And then either the remote or the batteries or something doesn't function properly. Uh, when you've lost the remote control, and maybe you're different than me, but when I lose the remote control, I sit in the frustration of not having the ease of changing the channel. Instead of getting up and literally walking this far to my TV... <laughs> I start screaming at my kid, who lost their remote? Why aren't there batteries in Jackson? <laughs> and then to make matters worse, I have a smart TV and I can use my phone. And so my children's like, well, dad, can't you just use your phone? I don't want to use my phone. Where's the remote? And it's this idea that in, in the, the, the approach to make life easier, we have walked into a level of more apathy. And I see this all the time. Like, I don't know why I need a robot in my house that I can talk to and tell Alexa to order me things from Amazon, but I do it because, you know, 
It's so inconvenient now to pull out my phone or computer and actually go online to shop because that's significantly more convenient than actually getting in the car and driving to the store that I want to pick up the item that, that I want. I have to tell the robot in my house to order it for me. In our attempts to make life easier, we've perpetuated a life of apathy. Right? It's not enough to have a phone with me wherever I go. You hear it sometimes because this happens way too often. Like Siri talks sometimes while I'm preaching. But here's what I do. When I want to call somebody, especially when I'm driving, I'll go like, hey, Siri, call. I'm not going to say it, but my dad. (laughs) Don't call him right now. (laughs) And she calls my dad. Or I'll say, hey, Siri, send a text to my dad. Hey, cool. Thanks for the present. Yours is on the way, right? Whatever it is, right? I use artificial intelligence to communicate for me. But sometimes when I'm driving behind the church, I don't get a great cell phone signal. And Siri says, working on that. One more minute, please. I'm sorry. I can't do that right now. And I'm so mad. (laughs) Because in the approach of trying to make my life easier, it is not working like I want to. And I am so lazy, I won't actually open my phone and push the numbers in to call my dad. I don't even have my dad's phone number memorized anymore. Oh, my dad's calling me. (laughs) (laughs) He may be watching online right now. That was funny. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. But in the inconvenience, right? I mean, I mean think about this. I don't, I don't have to know my way around a city anymore. I use my GPS. I don't, have to, I don't have to memorize phone numbers anymore. I have a phone book in my pocket. And not just that. I have a robot vacuum in my house. It cleans the floors. So I don't have to. And I spend most of my time yelling at it and, and, and incoherently and don't, not understanding the pattern it's going in to clean my floor, and I just think it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but in the process to make our lives easier, sometimes I think we've made it more complicated and more difficult. And it's perpetuated this sense of apathy that we should create something to do the tasks that we don't want to do. So here's my question in all this. What, what happens... When our approach to worshiping God becomes the same. Because look, I see our culture. I see that we are living in a world where we're trying to do more and more things and we're trying to make more and more things to make our lives more and more easy. But what happens when our approach to worshiping God is the same way? Because this is what I believe. When our worship requires effort, our effort will be met with God himself. When our worship requires effort, our effort will be met with God himself. But, but we, we don't really want our worship to require effort. We want our worship to require ease. That's why we want to come in here and we have designated time to worship every Sunday. We come in here and we have, we have the band who does an incredible job leading. And we look at other places or or other churches or other opportunities and we go, well, it's just not as easy. It's just not my style. It's just not what I like. When did worship become about what we like? Instead of adoration for our king. We're talking about worship today. It's a common theme. We talked about it last week. But it's a Christmas theme. We see this in scripture. If you have your Bibles, flip over to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, all right? It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who is born king of the Jews? So here we have the wise men. We don't know the number of wise men. I know all all the, the, the fun nativities and the memes that Joel puts up are have three wise men in them, but we don't actually know the official number of wise men. People say, well, it's three because there were three gifts, but we don't know that. There could have been 100 wise men as far. We could have been an army of wise men. It could have been two wise men. We don't know. We know that they came from the east. They're not from Jerusalem, or they're not from Israel, so they are not Jewish. And they show up in Jerusalem, which is Bethlehem, just so you understand, it's kind of a, an outskirts, the suburb of Jerusalem. And so all of a sudden, these guys show up 
in Jerusalem. And they were saying, where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem, Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Right, so it's an interesting situation. The wise men show up and Herod, who's in charge of the area, is like, hey, what's up, guys? What are y'all doing here? And he's like, well, there's, we saw the sign. We saw the star. The, the king of the Jews has been born. And Herod freaks out. It doesn't say he freaks out in here, but there's a little bit of the backstory you need to know about Herod. There had already been some Jewish uprisings at this time, and Herod was on pretty thin ice with his rule over the region. And if there's another one, there's a little bit of a threat that Herod is going to lose his position and or be killed because he couldn't govern properly. In fact, out of all of the Roman Empire, the Romans had a brilliant, terrible, but it was a brilliant system where they would go into an area, they would conquer the area, and instead of imposing Roman religion on that area, they would allow that religion to just be part of the larger religious system of Rome. The problem was that the, that the Jews believed this really pesky little thing that there's only one God and that he's the God. And he's the God that is worthy of all of our worship and that worshiping anyone else but this God is worshiping a false God. So they didn't really get along with Roman rule. The Jews were constantly trying to throw off Roman authority. And so when Herod hears this, thinking, whoa, whoa, there, there's, there's going to be another uprising. There's a king of these people. He calls the scribes, he calls the elders and tells them, hey, guys, I need to understand this more. Tell me about who this, this king of, of the Jews is. And so he's supposed to be in Bethlehem. He's going to be a shepherd. He's born in Bethlehem. So then Herod, verse 7, summoned the wise men and secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word that I may too come and worship him. A little like twist into the mustache on that one. <laughs> <laughs> After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, a star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they'd offered, they offered him gifts of gold, and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. You know, the theme of worship and Christmas is one that, that resonates deep inside of me. And the fact that so many people would come from so many different places, that shepherd, that wise men would come to this little town to find this, this child and worship a child as a king shows that the movement of God. But here's the thing, it also shows that effort to seek out worshiping God. I love that the wise men left their comfort zone to worship. They were not at home right? right. They, they, were, they were out, similar to the shepherds, they were living out of the doors, and they were not at home. There's an interesting Hebrew word for worship. It's this word right here, avadad. And the interesting thing about the word that we, the, the Hebrews used for worship also meant work or serve. The Greek word also means to serve. And there's this idea that, that worship and service and work are interrelated. You know, we don't, we don't often 
associate worship and work because, you know, there's this idea of Sabbath and we're not supposed to work. We go to church on our day off. Like there's this idea that, that, that work is work and, and worship is worship and those should be separate. But for an ancient Hebrew, that was not a separate concept. It was the same concept. And, and it wasn't something of ease, but it was something that was good. And so when, when, the, when the wise men spent time actually seeking to worship the king of the Jews, this baby, right? They are leaning into this idea that sometimes worship isn't easy. Sometimes worship requires effort. Sometimes worship and work are synonymous. Here's the point, right? We should search out opportunities to worship God, even if it requires effort or work on our part. Or we should search out opportunities to work for God. Because worship and work and service and effort lend in themselves to a closer relationship with God. That's what I mean, right? The wise men were searching for God, right? The wise men knew worship uh, to worship Jesus. The wise men knew to worship Jesus because one, they were looking for Jesus. Right? They recognized the sign of God and followed it to the feet of God. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened. You know what you don't find? That which you don't seek. If you want to find God to worship God, you got to seek God. you got to put effort into it. There's got to be work associated with your worship. There's also a satisfaction that comes when you find something that you've been searching for. A few years ago on Christmas, I was looking for a present for Ashley. And it was kind of the very beginning of the whole weighted blanket thing. And I was like, man, Ashley would love a weighted blanket. So, I, I mean, I searched the internet, everything was sold out. And then one day I was passing by Target and I saw one for sale. And I was like, that's a lot of money. I'm not going to spend that much money. But the more I thought about it, the more I was like, nah, I really need to get that. And so I go back to Target and they were out. And so I asked the sales associate, I was like, hey, hey, y'all just had some weighted blankets. He was like, he was, and he said to me, oh, you actually saw some on the, sh on the shelf? And I was like, yeah, like yesterday. And he was like, oh, no, no. If those are on the shelf, they're gone quickly. And I was like, oh, man, but that, now in my head, like I know the perfect gift, gift and nothing else will do. So I did what any sane individual will do. And I went to every Target in the metro Atlanta area, <laughs> which is about a billion, <laughs> to find this weighted blanket. And man, I went everywhere. Every time I went in, they were sold out. I would map it to the next closest target. Sold out, next closest, sold out, sold out, sold out. Finally, about an hour and 20 minutes away from my house, at a target, I forget, it wasn't Rome. It was, it was, I forget where, somewhere in the Atlanta metro area, I finally walk in and on the shelf in this section are two weighted blankets. And I found one and I thought about buying the second just in case the first was defective. <laughs> so I wasn't doing that again. And I finally found it and I was, yes, found it. And the satisfaction of finding the thing that I had searched for was almost as good as giving her the gift. Now, a side note, I will tell you that weighted blankets are terrible. <laughs> Here's the deal. It seems great. You're cold. You get in bed. You pull the weighted blanket up. It like snuggles you and you're like, oh, this is great. And then you fall asleep. And then you wake up in the middle of the night and it feels like something is trying to kill you. <laughs> and the weighted blanket is like around your neck and you're like, ah, I can't breathe. <laughs> And literally, after you fight to save your life, you push it on the floor and swear you're never using it again. That's, that's the process for me and a way to bring it. But the satisfaction that I had when I found what I was searching for is something a little bit more than even I can express. When we search for God... We are going to find God. It's a promise. So he, the question lends itself, how do we search for God? What does it mean to search for God? Like, do I go outside and go, God, I'm here, show up? Maybe. 
Obviously, we want to come in here and collectively and corporately search for God, but if this is the totality of your experience with God, I promise you you're missing out on something awesome. What does it mean to search for God? There's a simple formula for this, right? Right? Scripture and prayer, right? The most that I know about God has come from this. The second most I know about God is praying to God because prayer is the conversational language of God. And so I, I know this is going to sound a little elementary, but, but you want to seek God? Look in this. And look, I get it. It's not easy to always read this. It does not read as easy as a, a Nicholas Sparks novel. Okay, I get that. <laughs> The action's a little bit better. And the romance is too. I understand it's difficult. I understand you read, sometimes we read things out of frustration. We go, I just don't understand. I'm seeking God. I'm trying to understand, but I'm just not there. So I want to give you a very simple tool, right? I don't love acronyms, but this is an acronym. So know that there's a lot for me, right? It's word SOAP. Maybe some of you have seen this. It's pretty common. A lot of churches use this. They'll develop soap guides to hand out to people. But all this is is a very simple way of approaching Scripture. So I want to give you a practical tool that you can use as you read the Bible. And if, by the way, if you ever need a place to start, John. The first chapter is kind of a little weird, a little Platonism in there. Get past it. It's real good, right? Actually, even the first part's real good, right? All this means is SOAP. It's an acronym for Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer. Here's what you do. You take your Bible. You find the passage you want to read, and you know what? You read it. You observe what it says. If you have questions, that's okay. I have questions when I read it. Write them down. Email me. There's a couple of people that I literally, all we do is we meet and we sit and we talk about the questions they've come up with as they've read through scripture. And it is the best thing I get to do. It's so much fun. And I don't even know all the answers, right? Observe though, what does the Bible say? If you don't understand it, write the question down and either search for it or f- call someone who can help you find it. My email address is joel at lighthouseparker.com. Send me the questions. And then there's the idea of application, right? What do I apply from this to how I live my life? And then prayer. And it's as simple as God, help me to understand more and help me to apply this to my life, right? Does that mean that you're going to be a Bible scholar overnight? No. But you know what that does? It positions you in a place of seeking. And Jesus said, seek and you will find. It's a simple tool to help us understand scripture more. Turning our attention a little bit back to the story of the wise men. It's interesting when you look at all these nativities of what people assume the boxes look like that the wise men handed Jesus. They're always like real ornate and have like things dangling on them or pokey things sticking up. And that's not what my Christmas presents look like when I wrap them. Usually it's not straight lines and there's extra tape just to cover up the hole from where I ripped. It's, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. We don't know what, what, what the vessels look like of these things. But here's the deal. They've been traveling in saddlebags. I don't think that they looked as pristine as your nativities make them look. But we do have three gifts, right? There's gold and frankincense and myrrh. And you you may have been in a Christmas service before. You may have done your own study or read some stuff about the symbolism of each of these and how gold represents uh, the kingly gift to Jesus and how frankincense um, uh, is, is a scent that, that, that comes in an oil and it represents anointing uh, him, the king. And then, and then myrrh is an embalming tool that it is used to, to preserve the body. It's signifying Jesus' death. I'm not saying that there's no weight to any of that. I just think that there's another meaning that I want to look at for just a second today. Are you willing to maybe like break away from some preconceived ideas? We're okay with that. Even if that makes us uncomfortable with our Christmas traditions. I want you everybody to raise your right hand and repeat after me. (laughs) I will not blame Joel for ruining Christmas. (laughs) All right. I think it's actually better. I think you're going to like this. 
Flip on over to Exodus. Chapter 30. In Exodus chapter 30, we have a part of the Bible that we normally skip over because we don't really understand it. And it's difficult, and it's all about measurements and ingredients. And there's some words in here that are difficult to read, and I'm going to try my best. Don't make fun of me. Or do. I don't really care. Because what I think we see with gold and frankincense and myrrh is that each are used to facilitate worship in the Old Testament. Look at this, right? What we're talking about in these passages is the things that went into the tent of meeting, which we'll talk about here in just a second. But look at this in, in verse 30, I mean, chapter 30, verse 22, right? This is the anointing oil and incense. And the Lord said to Moses, take the finest spices of liquid myrrh, 500 shekels and sweet smelling cinnamon. That's a Christmas smell. There you go. Half as much as that is 250, 250 of aromatic cane and 500 of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary and the hen of, of olive oil. And you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil, which you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony. Right? So already we have the presence of myrrh in the tent of meeting. Right? It's used, it is used for anointing oil, so that's not wrong. Right? We, it is used as an anointing oil to anoint the whole tent and the Ark of the Covenant. Over the Ark of the Covenant is where the presence of God sat. In the tent of a meeting is where people would go to interact and meet with God. It's the single greatest place of worship at this point in the Old Testament. All right, flip on over, or flip on down to verse 34. Right, the Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, and here we go with the hard words, stacti and onicha and galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each there shall be an equal part, and make an incense blended as a perfumer seasoned with salt, pure and holy. Sorry, you I'm having trouble hearing you. And make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall, beat, you shall beat some of it very small and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I shall meet with you. Flip on down a few more verses, chapter 31. See, I have called by my name Bezalel, the son of, U of Uri, son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all, uh, and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for settings and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed him with Oholiab, the son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan. And all I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony in the mercy seat that is on it and all the furnishings of the tent gold and frankincense and myrrh were present in the tabernacle the tabernacle, before the temple was built, the tabernacle was kind of the mobile temple. It was the place to meet and worship God. The presence, the, the spirit of God dwelled in this. It was a place of worship. It was the, the place where, where, where I am. It's the presence was. And we could talk about gold and frankincense and myrrh as, as symbolic of embalming and, and Jesus is king. But, but, but what I read scripture, what I see is these three things are also used in worship of God to facilitate worship. And when it says that the wise men fell before him and worshiped him, these are instruments of worship. Gold and frankincense and myrrh are valuable, yeah, but they are instruments of worshiping God. And they were presented to a baby or a young child. God is inviting us to a place of worship. 
And we should offer him our instruments of worship. Colossians 3.23, right? Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. So here's my question that I want to put to you, that I want to put to us today. How can you work for God? How can you work for God? How do you, how do you ex- experience effort? How do you put forth effort for God? How do you worship God? What instruments have you been given to worship the King of Kings? Work, worship, service. Look, we want to facilitate opportunities for people to find their purpose in worshiping and serving God. We have lots of opportunities to do that. That is not going to be how some of you put forth effort because the truth is for some of you, it's really easy just to serve and you need to put more effort in worshiping God. Oh, well, I can do that. I've got time. Check. It's not about ease. It's not about the comfort. It's not about automating your worship. It's about putting forth effort to seek so you can find. So you can be uncomfortable. So you, we can leave our concept of home and seek the God that is creating a new home for us. Whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it as if working for God and not for man. There's a story. I was trying to figure out where I heard this because it's been so long but I heard a sermon one time, the story of a man in this church who was struggling with, with how he could use his job to worship God. He had a tire changing business, right? He, he changed tires. That's what he did. He didn't really see the connection between his work and how he could work changing tires for God. So he started doing something small. He would write Bible verses on pieces of paper and the number, and his cell phone number, or his telephone number, on the back of the piece of paper. He would put it in a bag, and he would put it in between the hubcap and the tire. So the next time someone would change the tire, they would find that scripture. And it wasn't something that, that, that was huge, but it, it did require a bit of effort, right? Not just to write it out, but, but to make sure that every single time you put a tire on, you're also finding this and putting it in there. And he would get phone calls from people telling them how much that his effort had blessed them. Sometimes it's not about how hard the work is, it's about fulfilling the effort. And he found a way to worship and to bring other people into it. Here's the thing, I would love to give you a formula like like I could with, with soap about, hey, this is how you put forth effort to worship. But the truth is, that is a you decision. That is dependent upon you. So your prayer this week, even going into Christmas, God, how can I put forth effort into worshiping you? How can I lean in? We talk about this phrase, we're going to lean in to worship. Is that like this? Do I lean to the drums because it's the loudest part? Like, what does leaning in to worship mean? Put your effort there. And each of it's going to be different. For me, it's going to look different than for you. This is going to be my prayer this week. And if I'm honest, I can stand up here and tell you, I don't know what it looks like for me to put more effort into worship, but I'm ready to seek. I'm ready to ask God how I can do that. And I'm asking you to join me. We each have instruments of worship. We just have to figure out what they are and how we use those to work and to serve and to worship God. But when we do, we can see that the worship that we get to experience isn't just coming and singing a few songs. It goes beyond that. It's walking into a place where the words that we sing or the actions that we do mean something to the depths of who we are. And that's a type of worship that I want to participate in.